good evening everybody and welcome to this program train program today today's topic is neuro imaging spotters as the title indicates we will be showing a series of cases neuro images maybe some brief clinical vignette will be given unfortunately we can't have interactive session for each case but at the end of the talk you can note down the you know the case number each case will be numbered so you can note down the case number and then raise the question at the end of the talk so this will not interrupt the flow of the talk so we'll have it this way and to give the today's talk we have dr sharath kumar ji ji who is a dm interventional neuroradiologist from nimhans currently he is working with the apollo hospital bangalore and also a visiting consultant at the st john's medical college bangalore he is a brilliant uh, uh, radiologist with phenomenal diagnostic accuracy and he has also mastered the art of neuro intervention he has one of the best outcomes we have seen with neuro interventions uh, he will be giving the talk today and i welcome dr sharath please take over proceedings good evening everyone thank you thank you sharma sir for the kind introduction and the opportunity to be here with uh, uh, with you all for uh, sharing few interesting cases uh, i would like to say that uh, it's very difficult to cover entire spectrum of uh, neurological uh, cases in within a span of uh, uh, one or two hours so uh, i apologize if i am missing anything and i will make sure that uh, whatever cases which uh, are a particular entity or a sub uh, sub category if i have missed uh, then i will uh, i will be sure that uh, in next uh, part 2 of this talk i will be trying to cover all of them so apologize me for that if i have missed out any important uh, neurological conditions in this first meeting and uh, this is basically to stimulate the students especially the exam going students and uh, learn now how do we approach in a given lesion how each and every sequences of the imaging it's like a mathematics if you miss one sequence you will miss the entire diagnosis so how do we approach uh, you, i will be discussing like how we diagnose then what are the uh, important uh, a radiological differential diagnosis and uh, without a clinical details without any history it is just a black and white images so the life to these images come when you give us a relevant history and guide us like what we are trying to look at then the differential diagnosis completely changes and ultimately we can uh, help the patient to arrive at the diagnosis so few of the cases are interesting cases few of them are spotters and uh, uh, i have not uh, added a lot of clinical information uh, like a typical radiologist i have added more pictures less clinical information because i thought these are a uh, few cases which we should make a spot diagnosis or at least uh, 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 or at least uh, we should narrow down the differential diagnosis significantly by looking at the images itself so let me start with a few cases like uh, uh, this was my five, first case when i started my career Uh, long back so this is a case number 1 and uh, it's a 3 year old child who came with a history the history written in the uh, uh, in the mri requisition was choreoathetosis since the age of 2 months now the ch uh, child is already 3 year old and uh, she also had a ataxia with a mild developmental delay full term normal delivery cried immediately after the birth so there was no perinatal history suggestive of hypoxic insult but had a prolonged history of uh, neonatal jaundice and she was admitted uh, over a period of month in a neonatal icu and uh, typically we our first sequence will be diffusion weighted images diffusion didn't show us anything so then the next important sequence we do is uh, flare images followed by t2 and t1 so when we saw the flare images it was very very subtle like you could see bilateral symmetrical signal changes whenever we see bilateral symmetrical signal changes we always think of uh, something which is systemic or something which is iner inherited or a metabolic disorder when uh, i could see that uh, the globus pallidus on either side uh, uh, was uh, hyper intense and it was very subtle as and i try, i thought i will zoom it and show here and globus pallidus it was more like uh, globus pallidus interna and uh, the similar signal changes when we saw in the flare it was easy to pick up on t2 weighted images as well and t1 was also subtle the linear hyper intensity like this this was a symmetrical bilateral globus pallidus rest of the brain parenchyma was completely normal 
they, and these signal changes were not showing any restricted diffusion there were they were not showing any blooming on susceptibility weighted imaging there was no announcement on post contrast study this was a gradient images earlier days we had only t2 star gre nowadays we have swi imaging which is a two to three times more powerful in picking up the susceptibility and uh, they are very useful nowadays and uh, these are the signal changes which you can see in a bilateral globus pallidus so what are the differential diagnosis in this case we diagnosed uh, because there was a pre, uh, history of carnectrus uh, this is carnectrus encephalopathy there is a bilirubin encephalopathy uh, which characteristically shows uh, high signal intensity in the bilateral globus pallidus because our history was very clear and uh, corresponding to the areas of uh, preferential uh, deposition of the unconjugated bilirubin you uh, you got the signal changes there and postromedial boundary of the uh, border of the globus pallidus is said to be the most sensitive area to carnicterous lesions on mri and uh, if you see whenever bilateral globus pallidus hypertricity if you don't have any history i i i generally think of all these things i generally ask any history of uh, Uh, prolonged uh, neonatal jaundice or anything uh, similar uh, similar episodes the, at the time of newborn and uh, other important uh, dds are organic acidurias especially methyl melanos uh, melonic acidemia is one of the closest dd which can mimic the carnictrus next comes the propionic acidemia then pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency also can give similar bilateral symmetrical uh, uh, globus pallidus uh, signal changes these are the three important uh, differential diagnosis in neonatal period and in uh, others like adults if you see similar changes we always consider carbon monoxide poisoning as gas geyser toxicity uh, so all this will be uh, it has a different clinical profile and we have will have a different uh, age group as well so these are the differential diagnosis so whenever i see globus pallidus i ask about the issue of carnectrus then other organic acidurias and pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency these are the top differential diagnosis there were several literatures which has been published in the mri pictures in carnectrus you could go through this literature as well there are this is one of the case uh, report published from kem mumbai and uh, this is a teaching neuro image from the green journal of neurology which is a case of uh, methyl melanic acidemia you can see the similar picture what uh, was seen in our case patient uh, of, of course will have a a uh, 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 very characteristic uh, clinical profile as well so coming to case number 2 it's a spotter this is the diffusion weighted as i told we do our diffusion weighted images with this diffusion weighted images you can see that because since i can't interact i will just read for you what are the imaging findings here these are the 1000b value dw images the corresponding adc was showing high point intensity then only we will call it as a restricted diffusion you can see this there were some complete ring like restricted diffusion there were some incomplete ring like restricted diffusion especially in the gravoid junction here and if you see them carefully if you observe these incomplete rings are open ring like a uh, picture uh, is towards the cortex if, especially in the parasitical area or in the right frontal you can see that this openness is towards the uh, cortex so whenever you see this we always make our differential diagnosis as a to me effective demelination and uh, these are the literatures which suggest that and whenever you give a contrast in these patients you will get a, whatever the areas which were corresponding to the restricted diffusion you will see a announcement there and always the open ring uh, this may be complete or a open ring open ring is relatively a very specific sign of demelination the enhancing component is start to represent advancing front of the demelination and thus favor the white matter side of the lesion the open part of the ring will therefore usually point towards the gray matter like in this case you can see here and we also call it as r shoe enhancement pattern or leading edge enhancement this is another case a companion case a single lesion solitary lesion a large lesion the another important finding if you do if you see this the mass effect and the uh, edema will uh, unlike uh, if you find a lymphoma or a metastasis or an abscess you will have a disproportionate edema and a mass effect which you don't see in a classical case of de to me effective demelination apart from this open ring enhancement uh, and a, a open ring like uh, restricted diffusion and if you see t2 the t2 will be very bright like a csf in the core and uh, generally you don't get such a mass effect irrespective uh, it will be disproportionate to the size of the lesion 
usually in metastasis or a lymphoma or a abscess, you see that uh, even in spite of the lesion being very small, you get a lot of edema, mass effect, and midline shift. But it's exactly opposite in tumor effective depenylation. So coming to the case number three, is also a spotter. This is the, uh, these are the two pictures of uh, first row is a different patient. Second row is a different patient. And uh, in the first row, this is a T2 weighted image. This is a T2 star uh, gradient. And this is the T1 SAG. And it is a, another patient. I have put uh, both the patients together because they come under the same spectrum disorder. This is a axial T2 gradient and a flare. What basically is uh, uh, the top row is showing is uh, volume loss in bilateral middle cerebral peduncles, MCPs, the cruciform hyperintensity in the pons. You can see very well hot cross bun sign in the pons. And you don't, and you see that uh, volume loss, the belly of the pons is uh, reduced, but you don't see any midbrain atrophy here. So this is a typical uh, picture of combination of uh, cerebellar atrophy, MCP, and cruciform hyperintensity that is giving hot cross bun sign. This is a case of uh, MSAC. You know clinically how they present, so I'm not going to uh, into the details. This is a MSAP where you see there's a uh, V-shaped posterolateral uh, and posteromedial part of that V-shaped uh, mineralization, especially if you do SW, you will uh, pick up these uh, uh, mineralization very, uh, very well. And this V-shaped, uh, apart from uh, uh, this V-shaped uh, mineralization can be seen in uh, old age also, but it, sh it should be associated with the volume loss of the putamen. And as a result of volume loss of the putamen, you will see outer putaminal ring. This presence of outer putaminal rim, volume loss, and V-shaped hyperintensity is also an imaging feature which is very much suggestive of uh, MSAP. And this is a case of MSAC. So in MSAC, you see a cruciform pontine hyperintensity, cerebellar atrophy, atrophy of the peduncles with or without signal changes. You may also get MCP sign, that is bilateral symmetrical signal changes on the T2 weighted images involving middle cerebral peduncles. In MSAP, putaminal atrophy, outer putaminal rim, dorsal lateral putaminal mineralization, as I showed you. So coming to case number four, this is also another spotter. Uh, you can see that uh, this, uh, these are the T2 weighted images. I have zoomed few of the pictures here. And this is a SAGE T1 weighted images. These are the coronal T2, uh, coronal T2 weighted images. You can see in the first picture, the very important finding here is uh, flattening of this globe. Flattening of the posture globe, distension of the perioptic CSF sheet, some tortuosity you can see, a lot of uh, tortuosity on the axial sections itself. This flattening is very, very characteristic, one of the very, very sensitive rather than just commenting on this uh, empty cell. Flattening of the globe has got more sensit uh, sensitivity. And uh, you can see the same distended perioptic sheet on the coronal images. And uh, these are the other pictures that are showing empty cell. And if you see this uh, MR venogram, because uh, generally when a patient presents with a headache and, and, and clinically when you find a papillary edema, we should always uh, rule out a cerebral venous thrombosis. When we do a venogram, you see that uh, characteristically there are uh, symmetrical. So, so many times uh, one of the sinus will be hypoplastic, one of them will be dominant. Most of the time the dominant sinus transfer sinus, sigma sinus junction will have a narrowing. The focal short segment narrowing will be there. That will be a very, very characteristic finding of uh, uh, IAH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We don't know whether it is a cause or a consequence of IAH. There is a, uh, there is a controversial discussion which goes on uh, and it's not yet resolved actually. And if you see in this case, there is a, uh, both are co-dominant and both the sinuses, in the lateral aspect of the transverse sinus where it takes a bend, there's a uh, significant stenosis involved. So whenever we see such findings along with this, and a clinically, if the patient have papillary edema, it's very, very easy to give a diagnosis, especially in a characteristic case, another companion case. If you see this, I could see a restricted diffusion in the optic discard. It's a very, very dangerous ominous sign. The patient may lose a vision. If you see that post-contrast images, I could see even enhancing discs. Apart from the, all the other classical features which we were discussing, involvement of uh, bilateral lateral part of the transfer sinus, uh, going for narrowing, flattening of the globe, posterior globe, protrusion of the optic disc, and uh, optic disc edema and enhancement. So all were seen in this case. You can see, I, I thought I will zoom this so that you can appreciate the enhancement on both the sides. 
and the torture city is very well appreciated apart from the empty cella. In one of similar case, uh, we had uh, done a measurement. There's a manometry. What we do is when we do uh, under local, when the patient is conscious, we just puncture the femoral artery because this patient, in spite of doing adequate uh, 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 medical management, she was deteriorating. So we offered and the patient wanted this procedure and we went inside under the local anesthesia, went inside into the superior settle sinus, uh, took, took a micro catheter. We kept on measuring the pressure incrementally at every 10 centimeters when we and uh, when we measure the pressure gradient across the stenosis it was more than 10 millimeters of mercury then after confirming the significant pressure gradient generally we offer the treatment if there is no gradient we generally don't do the procedure and the mm -hmm. patient agreed for the procedure and we did a venous stenosis, uh, sinus stenting the patient actually did very well so the, I will not go into the typical uh, uh, dand uh, modified dandy criteria of IIH, but uh, as a radiologist, what I typically see is apart from empty cell, which uh, when present in isolation doesn't carry any meaning, they should have a relevant uh, uh, clinical info, uh, clinical picture like papilledema and uh, in in association with other uh, imaging uh, pictures like. Uh, uh, like slit like ventricle tight subarachnoid spaces which we generally don't uh, observe in all the cases but flattening of the posterior globe protrusion of the optic nerve head enhancement of the optic nerve head distension of the optic sheath uh, vertical torticity of the optic nerve because the horizontal torticity may be seen here physiologically in many of the people along with the typical uh, imaging picture of the uh, transverse okay. sinus so, uh, transverse sigma junction uh, going to case number 5 spotter 18 year old female found unconscious in the early morning, no significant past history. When the parents uh, uh, tried to woke up, woke her up, she didn't open the door. So she brought her to the emergency and uh, she was found unconscious in her room. And uh, this was the only abnormality what, uh, uh, sorry, this history is someone else. I think this is the case. Yeah. Uh, this is this was the uh, only abnormality what we could see only on diffusion weighted images rest of all the sequences were normal basically this is a uh, this dwo images are showing symmetrical signal changes again involving posterior limb of the internal capsule you can see here on either side very subtle you have to be very careful you may miss completely apart from bilateral middle cerebellar peduncle hyperintensities here like mcp but this was not picked up on any other sequence including fair it was only seen on dwo images so this is a classical uh, imaging picture of uh, adult hypoglycemia. Patient had a profound hypoglycemia. Uh, the, we corrected sugars actually in the MRI gantry itself. Uh, unfortunately, this should not be diagnosed on MRI. This should be diagnosed in emergency as soon as the patient comes. It's a basic to measure the glucose level. This was long back. Uh, this patient was shifted to emergency uh, from emergency directly to MRI. We, after diffusion, we stopped the scan. We measured uh, we measured the sugars and corrected it inside the gantry. The patient woke up. Similar case. This was an elderly male, sudden onset, difficulty in walking, followed by drowsiness. He was found, this was a CKD patient on hemodialysis in the early morning. Then he had a similar picture, bilateral postural limb of internal capsule hyperintensity. He also had a profound hypoglycemia, which was corrected and patient became very well. So there is a specific pattern of adult hypoglycemia, especially if you, if you do a diffusion weighted images. We usually divide them as a white matter pattern and the gray matter pattern. Whenever in, this is specific to adults, what I am talking to, whenever uh, whenever the hypoglycemia is short and mild, generally we get a white matter uh, involvement. When the hypoglycemia is prolonged and profound, they carry poor prognosis and invariably the gray matter will be involved and the outcome is very poor. But the white matter pattern has a, got a very good prognosis. Generally, they do well with the rapid correction. And uh, white matter pattern, I mean is a symmetrical involvement of uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule and the corona radiata. You may just see in the corona radiata and uh, with or without involvement of uh, other structures, especially the splenium of the corpus callosum, bilateral MCPs. Whenever we see that, we always rule out hypoglycemia first. There are some other conditions which can mimic uh, uh, this uh, adult type of white matter hypoglycemic encephalopathy, especially the postpartum ladies who present with hypernatremia. Hypernatremic encephalopathy can also have a similar picture, and that is involvement of uh, internal capsules, splenium of the corpus callosum, and corona radiata. So we, uh, we, we, we have to be very careful and uh, we have to see the, what is the clinical information being provided, and, uh, uh, do, uh, and accordingly, we have to differentiate both of them. This is a case number six. 
uh, another spotter this is another uh, moment disorder is a uh, is a typical you can see these are the t2 weighted images axial t1 uh, axial t2 weighted images sagittal t1 weighted images here if you see this you can see that uh, the pons is relatively appearing very big as compared to the midbrain and if you see the midbrain there is a progressive flattening there the relatively the midbrain volume loss is there and uh, similarly the midbrain volume loss is also apparent but not as apparent as uh, as you see on the t1 weighted images always we should have a the good best sequence is to look at the 3d t1 weighted images in the mid sagittal plane and you have a definite uh, these are the different signs which has been described and more importantly uh, the t1 if i have a t1 weighted volume sequence i try to use them for the other measurements especially the ap diameter at the level of superior colliculus measuring less than 12 mm the concavity on the lateral aspect of this midbrain which we known as uh, morning glory sign this resembles this uh, concavity of the flower morning glory and also it can mimic the face of the mickey mouse we have, people have also done uh, specific uh, volumetric measurements they have carried uh, they have done a area measurement in the sagittal plane that is the ratio of the uh, midbrain to pons ratio that uh, if the normal is generally around 0.24 so reduced area ratio that is midbrain to pontine ratio on the mid sagittal plane uh, uh, to approximately 0.12 is has got a very very specific uh, that is less than 0.2 has got a very specific uh, uh, diagnostic value for the pro, uh, case of uh, cases of progressive supranuclear palsy diagnosis and other signs as uh, this is the king penguin sign where the belly of the pons appears relatively big and this specific elongation of the beak like appearance there is a flattening of the superior surface of the uh, midbrain is also very very characteristic like this also known as hummingbird sign so these are the different different signs which we classically but this area measurement will be sometimes very useful and so many times psp classical psp is where uh, uh, we get all these things sometimes there will be a lot of overlaps there is a brain stem variant of psp cortical variant of psp with other combinations we should be careful when we are diagnosing them so appropriate clinical information will help us so case number 7 this is a 25 year old uh, male patient uh, man who presented with he had a previous rta and uh, decompression and hemicarinectomy was done on the day one and then on uh, 15 this patient uh, started to develop hydrocephalus and uh, as a consequence of that the vp shunt was done as soon as uh, it was done the sh was shunting was done the patient came on day 20 with a deterioration in his sensorium you could see that uh, this is a dramatic picture where the uh, craniotomy flap has been pushed inwards it's a significant midline shift you can see that shunting uh, shunt here on the left side and mid marked midline shift subfalcine herniation and this is a, another emergency and uh, this is known as sinking uh, sinking skin flap syndrome or a paradoxical brain herniation we have to identify these uh, cases in emergency put these patients in the trendelan position start iv fluids if you have done a shunt ask the surgeon just to uh, stop it uh, stop the flow of this shunt because uh, it is a true emergency and uh, and we have to, uh, we have to immediately try to uh, do a cranioplasty if possible because that is a definitive treatment and uh, why it happens basically atmospheric pressure exceeds the intracranial pressure at the craniotomy resulting in displacement of the brain across the various intracranial boundaries it is often triggered by acute imbalance caused by csf drainage or a lumbar puncture so we should be very very careful when we are doing lumbar puncture in such cases and uh, cranioplasty is the definitive treatment for such conditions case number 8 spotter 40 year old may, uh, lady with a uh, tingling numbness this is a typical picture what we get this is a t2 weighted uh, sorry stir images in the sagittal plane t2 weighted images in the axial at the cervical cord level you can have uh, labeled here c2 c3 level you can see here what basically it shows is you can see a linear t2 hyper intensity in the posterior aspect of the cord involving the upper cervical cord and on axial sections these uh, signal changes are symmetrical uh, uh, restricted the corresponding to the posterior column giving a inverted v like appearance and uh, you can see that uh, in one of the case it has gone low down up to the dorsal cord similar case 
and this is a classical case of uh, subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord but most importantly there are several differential diagnoses of uh, SACD, so we, we have to confirm the diagnosis rather than labeling that and uh, uh, i will go into those pictures like there are at least more than five i can name at least eight of these uh, differential diagnoses on the radiology if i don't know the any clinical information i have to give many differential diagnosis for that this uh, typical v like hyperintensity or uh, inverted rabbit ear sign uh, can be seen uh, most commonly in b12 as i showed you even after nitrous oxide uh, toxicity after nitrous oxide anesthesia in few patients nowadays a lot of bariatric surgery being done so copper deficiency out to be kept as a differential diagnosis if the patient is immunocompromised hiv positive aids patient then it's a hiv vacular myelopathy have similar picture tertiary syphilis also have shown similar picture and more than diabetic i would consider like uh, uh, in a vitamin e deficiency alpha to uh, uh, tocopherol deficiency, CTX cases, especially spinal cerebrotendinous anthematosis can also have this uh, symmetrical bilateral posterior column hyperintensity. So uh, there are various differential diagnoses we have to be uh, aware of so that we can narrow down the differential diagnosis. Case number nine, a spotta. The spotta, so I have not given any clinical information. This is a classical picture on the axial titubated images. You could see that posterior limb of the internal capsule is hyper intense. And on a typical, uh, on the coronal images, it's giving typical wine glass appearances. And uh, whenever we see this, we always consider uh, motor neuron disease or ALS. But uh, this can also be seen in other conditions, few of the conditions which was reported from uh, KLE. Uh, so this uh, wine glass sign was also seen in postpartum hypernatremia, as I told you. Uh, when we see a posterior limb of internal capsule or corona radiate hyperintensity, we keep uh, hypernatremia and hypoglycemia as a differential diagnosis that if you see in a corona elevated images, uh, because these uh, uh, metabolic conditions are not very well picked up on T2, unlike diffusion, diffusion is very sensitive. And uh, in ALS, you can pick up very well on the uh, uh, T2 weighted or flare images as compared to diffusion weighted images. Recently, I, uh, I, I could uh, read some of the interesting cases. Uh, the, one of the patient had a similar wine glass sign and uh, after following a COVID-19 vaccination, I'm not aware what, how, uh, what was the cause in this uh, case. The details were not uh, uh, very well given, but uh, the, I, I thought I should uh, share this in another wine glass sign in a post-COVID-19 vaccine in a healthy, relatively healthy patient. So case number 10, 13-year-old boy with bilateral vision loss since two days. I thought I should give, uh, put a uh, optic nerve case as well because that will uh, help us to uh, uh, show some of the spectrum of disorders which uh, where the optic nerve involvement is very common. In this patient, if you see, uh, this is the optic nerve uh, acquired uh, on the sagittal plane. Always we acquire optic nerve imaging with the fat suppressed sequence, either it is T1 or T2. The fat in the retrobulbar uh, uh, area should be suppressed using appropriate uh, fat suppressed sequences. So this is a T2 fat suppressed sequence, thin section, three millimeter at least, not more than that. And this is a post contrast image. And this is the coronal T2 and flare images apart from the uh, bilateral optic nerve involvement, we could see some non-specific white matter changes adjacent to the cortex. And uh, you can see that the involved optic nerve is swollen, very bright, dramatic picture and showing enhancement as well. Uh, and this patient had uh, had a very strong positive for a uh, MOG antibodies. If you see these pictures, apart from anterior optic pathway being involved and relative sparing of the posterior optic pathway, we can see a transition zone very well there. <clears throat> Opticism and posterior optic pathway was very intraorbital segment of the optic nerve was very much involved, and we could see that perioptic stranding was very well appreciated. And along with this white matter changes, this uh, is a very classical picture of uh, antimog antibody associated optic neuritis. If you want to see uh, the better picture of perioptic stranding, which is very characteristic differentiating point from rest of the other uh, inflammatory demyelinating, especially NMO and MS, is the perioptic sheath and the perioptic uh, fat stranding. That is uh, striations or a dirty white matter, dirty appearance of the uh, surrounding fat. This is uh, called as uh, perioptic fat stranding. And you can also appreciate sometimes on the diffusion weighted images, the marked brightness and swollen appearance of the optic nerves extending up to the optic nerve head. You can see here the spindle shaped swelling, such a marked swelling of the anterior optic nerve, but abrupt transition into the posterior optic nerve, which is relatively normal. Even the coronal fat suppressed images are also showing 
dirty appearance around the optic nerve sheath. So this is called as perioptic fat stranding, which is depicted in this image as well. And uh, just to complete uh, uh, the uh, anti-MOG spectrum, I thought I will just uh, brief this. Uh, usually in MOG as well as in NMO, bilateral optic nerve involvement is very common. At the first presentation itself, maybe up to 84 case, 84 percent of the cases have bilateral involvement in MOG associated disease, and 82 uh, percent in uh, coporin positive NMOST. And only in 23% of the cases of MS at the onset, uh, they will have uh, bilateral involvement. Most of the MS patients have short segment optic neuritis, unlike this is a long segment optic neuritis. They will be usually mid portion of the optic nerve involved, mostly unilateral. And in MOG, long segment bilateral, sp relative sparing of the posterior uh, optic pathway, exactly opposite uh, to the MOG long segment optic neuritis, but predilection to posterior optic pathway, especially chiasmal neuritis and retrochiasmatic pathway, and absence of perioptic fat stranding in both NMO as well as MS, which, which makes uh, MOG diagnosis very easy. So other manifestation of MOG, they can either present with uh, ADM-like features on the brain or atypical brainstem demyelination. So these are the two other manifestation apart from optic neuritis of the brain and sometimes young patient presenting with epilepsy or seizures, sorry, presenting with seizures can also have this characteristic uh, MR imaging appearance. This is known as flames. This is known as fuel. Flame stands for flare hyperintense lesions in antimog associated encephalitis with seizures. You can uni unilateral encephalitis like picture. You can see flare hyperintensity in the circle spaces. Uh, so, and uh, adjacent white matter being hypo, this is a typical like encephalitis uh, like picture and those showing enhancement is known as fuel, flare variable unilateral enhancement. So this is also a manifestation which can mimic like encephalitis, but CSF will be will not be a typical of uh, any infective process, though you should remember this spectrum as well uh, of the MOG. So uh, uh, apart from that, spinal cord involvement, this also similar to NMOST presents with uh, LETM, but conus predilection is uh, one of the characteristic. And whenever you see a conus predilection or the cervical cord or any other part of the cord being involved, sometimes you see this linear hyperintensity in the center corresponding to the central canal because the peri, uh, peri central canal involvement of that, it gives a pseudo syrinx appearance, which is known as uh, Sagittal linear hyperintensity, similar here. You can see it is not a syrinx, but a pseudo syrinx like picture and cloud like uh, hyperintensity around it. So it is a pseudo dilatation or a pseudo syrinx appearance. In the uh, axial sections in the MOG, you can see H shaped uh, hyperintensity involving the central gray. So case number 11, 60 year old man with a history of pain and slowly progressive weakness of both lower limbs did not respond to any treatment and worsened with the bladder involvement after the course of steroids. So this patient was being treated as LETM, sorry. And this patient when initially came and it was completely missed uh, and the patient uh, had some patchy hyperintensity in the dorsal uh, and lumbar cord, upper lumbar and the dorsal, lower dorsal cord. And what uh, important finding which was missed by a radiologist in this uh, T2 sagittal images are presence of some serpiginous channels on the surface of the cord, which was completely missed, probably by doing heavily titubated images like CIS or Fiesta, these uh, channels would have not been missed. But unfortunately, it was missed. When he came back again, the patient had a, a, a extensive involvement of the white matter changes uh, in the uh, cervix, in the card, uh, dorsal lumbar cord. What is characteristic is relative sparing of the periphery of the cord. It was predominantly central, mimicking a transverse myelitis, thin eye point in uh, periphery. This is also very characteristic. If you carefully see, uh, you get a serpiginous uh, flow whites on the surface of the card, especially the posterior asp. That is very, very characteristic here. And uh, this is a classical case of uh, especially elderly male presenting with slowly progressive paraparesis in pain, sensory symptoms followed by motor and then involvement of the bladder and bowel. Before the bladder and bowel gets involved, we should treat them because it's a potentially treatable cause of paraparesis, uh, para paraplegia. If you uh, miss the diagnosis, uh, then most of the time the uh, we land up uh, uh, in not curing the patients and more invariably all our patients what we have observed is they, they will have at least six to one month delay in the imaging and the definitive treatment because of not diagnosing them. The imaging uh, investigation of choice when you suspect a case of uh, spinal 
dural AV fistula, any vascular malformation in the spine for that matter is a catheter angiogram. Spinal catheter angiography uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, we, it, it require, we have to cannulate each and every vessels, the intercostal arteries. When we don't get anything, we have to do internal iliac angiograms, which man uh, sometimes uh, uh, pick up a dural AV fistulas or any other fistulas, which may be completely missed. So even if you don't pick up anything in the iliacs, then we have to do uh, the cerebral angiogram as well to complete the study before we label it as negative. And uh, as a uh, and generally, it's done under general anesthesia with intermittent apnea. If the patient is very cooperative, generally, uh, then only we consider them uh, doing under local anesthesia because patient has to hold the breath when we are acquiring the images. Otherwise, the respiratory movement will degrade the image quality and we may completely miss the subtle findings. And uh, angiogram is not complete unless we demonstrate this artery. This, this artery is the artery of Adam Kivix. It's is a uh, anterospinal artery, which is the largest, which uh, anterospinal artery is a single artery, which uh, runs from uh, V4 segment of the vertebral artery to the tip of the sacrum, but it's uh, augmented at multiple levels. And one of the largest augmentation is the artery of uh, Adam Kivix. You can see how to identify this artery. Whenever we see an artery which is takes off and goes higher level, takes a hairpin bend and comes down and it is always in the midline. So this is a characteristic curve. In the post, uh, there are two posterior spinal artery. If you see posterior spinal artery, they are uh, they are parasagittal, not in the midline, and they have a characteristic knot-like appearance, unlike hairpin bend. Uh, that is how we differentiate on uh, angiographic images. Always, it is important to demonstrate and document from where the artery of Adam Kivitz is uh, appearing, because if this artery is arising and uh, same artery is also giving a uh, vascular malformation, then it's a, then we have to abandon the endovascular intervention because any reflux into this artery may lead to a devastating complication of uh, spinal cord infarct. So that's why this artery has to be demonstrated. Otherwise, your procedure or diagnostic angiogram is incomplete. So this is a typical picture of spinal dural AV fistula. You can see a segmental artery or catheter. This is a, where the fistula is, and this is the venous outflow. This, unfortunately, the uh, the fistula is always at the neural foramen level, supplied by a meningeal artery known as radiculomeningeal artery. But the venous drainage is always to the perimedullary vein. This perimedullary vein is the vein which drains the normal cord parenchyma and ends the venous pressure builds up within the parenchyma, resulting in via chronic venous congestion and uh, as a result of that, the patient deteriorates progressively. So spinal dural AV fistula is a treatable condition. If you identify and promptly treat them at the earliest, radicular meningeal artery is the arterial supply, which I showed you. And the venous drainage is to the perimedullary venous plexus, which also drains the normal cord. And hence, it competes with the uh, normal venous flow of the spinal cord. Increased perimedullary venous pressure because of venous hypertension results in venous cord ischemia. So as I told you, they slowly progress, give enough time, but uh, we have to identify them and treat them. Typically, they are middle or elderly males, very, very common in males. There are few cases which we have seen in females, but predominantly a disease of elderly male. On imaging, uh, we see a swollen card with relative sparing of the thin, uh, thin periphery. Usually, in a long-standing case, even you can identify hemocytin deposition because of chronic venous congestion in the periphery giving that characteristic T2 hyperintensity on either side or around the white, uh, white matter hyperintensity and the, uh, sorry, central hyperintensity and uh, presents a demonstration of uh, prominent veins on the subarachnoid space is a characteristic. We have to demonstrate that. And then only we can suspect a case of dural AV fistula. So another case which we always get a reference for uh, saying that uh, uh, there is a thrombosis. In, these are the titivated uh, axial sections. You can see that something is hyperintense, which uh, on corresponding side, it is hypointense. Always we get a, a second opinion or a reference saying that uh, there is a thrombosis of this is this structure is an internal jugular vein and this is the vertebral artery flow. But these are the axial titivated sections. Normally uh, in a titivated images, either the artery or the vein should have signal loss. Wherever there is a flow, there will be signal loss. So whenever we lose this signal and the signal gain happens, that is, it becomes bright on T2 rather than T2 hypo, then we consider it as always as abnormal. So this raises a suspicion of uh, jugular vein thrombosis. But, uh, but if you uh, we observe, we see that always this happens on the left side. So there should be some reason why it always happens. It's actually not a case of uh, jugular vein thrombosis, but it's a uh, artifactual signal gain. As we know, uh, if you see this, uh, 
the uh, innominate vein which comes and joins the superior vena cava on the left side is very long and it has to cross the arch of aorta or the great arteries of the arising from the arch of aorta unlike uh, on the right side which is a very short and direct entry to the vena cava because of this prolonged or a long course this is always uh, prone to uh, vascular compression uh, and also the slow flow because of this uh, anatomy and as a result of that we get always a spurious signal gain within the inf uh, internal uh, jugular vein so one should be very very careful we should not subject how do we confirm we can do a doppler and just confirm them but uh, most of the time we ignore because we know that this is a spurious thing so this is one of the uh, uh, smaller thing but very important because it avoids unnecessary panic and uh, intervention in these cases uh, another case 23 year old uh, uh, lady 8 months amenorrhea 8 months pregnant lady presented with one episode of seizure since she presented with seizure uh, mri was recommended to rule out uh, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and uh, this came uh, for a second opinion because it was reported as uh, pituitary hyperintensity on the t1 weighted images you could see that this is a posterior pituitary, but uh, surprisingly, the anterior pituitary also was very bright. We only expect posterior pituitary to be bright on T1 weighted images. This is unsubtracted. That is no fat suppression done. It's a, just a routine T1 weighted sequence. And uh, posterior pituitary bright spots is a normal physiological finding. But uh, uh, why the radiologist was uh, worried? Because the anterior pituitary was also bright. So look at this. You can differentiate the posterior from anterior, but this was very bright. And uh, physiological hypertrophy of the pituitary is very common. It may even sometimes uh, cross 12 millimeters in vertical height. It's, very, it's a physiological phenomenon, especially in the third trimester or immediate uh, postpartum. So it was basically sent, uh, probably suggesting it was apoplexy of the pituitary because patient had a seizure or one, uh, one episode of a seizure and a day. And uh, this is, uh, we should al always be aware that the, the physiological T1 hyperintensity of the Adeno hypophysis uh, is, uh, is, is well known because especially the third trimester and the immediate uh, postpartum period, it has been suggested that uh, because of high protein synthesis uh, in these uh, cells in the adeno hypophysis and increased bone fraction of the water molecule and increase in number of secretory granules, uh, this uh, pituitary always appears T1 hyperintense. So we should not be panicky when we see such hyperintensity. It's a physiological. Uh, in a couple of months, it gains the normal signal intensity, which should be equivalent to the signal intensity of the adjacent pawns. Whenever you find bright pituitary without any fluid levels, just a uniform uh, pituitary gland uh, with a good uh, convex border superiorly and uh, uniform T1 hyperintensity, no fluid fluid levels, no blooming, then you should not be worried. And it will, uh, it's most likely will be a physiological hypertrophy and the signal intensity. Similar findings can also be seen in uh, physiologically in newborns. Uh, same explanation similar to the mother. So this is also not an abnormality. This also will, will uh, get a normal signal intensity after a few days. If you compare to the pons, normally we always compare our normal pituitary signal to the pons, adjacent pons in the sagittal. But in this case, it was more brighter. So it is also a physiological similar to the uh, pregnant lady. So another three more pituitary pathologies which are associated with uh, pregnancy, what we should consider is, uh, these are the three conditions which uh, as a radiologist, we always remember. The pituitary apoplexy, you can see that fluid fluid level on the dependent portion here. This is a case of apoplexy. They present with thunderclap headaches mostly, lymphocytic hypophysitis, uh, thickening of the stalk and uh, intense enhancement and Sheehan syndrome. You can see the ring-like enhancement and the pituitary necrosis there. So these are the three other uh, uh, pathologies associated with the pregnancy involving pituitary glands. So next. And uh, this is another, uh, though this is not a tumor, why I'm showing this is uh, because it's a no-touch lesion. Whenever you see this case, we should try to identify uh, this condition and uh, uh, and it's because it's a no touch lesion, it's a conservative management and have a characteristic imaging picture. This is a, uh, another young fellow who presented with headache and one episode of vomiting. When the imaging was done, this was a surprise. You can see that T1 weighted images, T2 weighted images, flare images, and post contrast T1 weighted images. The lesion is uh, hypo on T1, 
have a characteristic linear uh, hyperintensity involving the right half of the cerebellum, flare images, hardly any edema around it, and it's not enhancing at all. This lesion was also not showing any susceptibility, no restricted diffusion within them. And this lesion have a characteristic appearance. This is known as a striated or tigroid appearance or corduroy or laminated appearance. This is a classical case of a dysplastic cerebellar gangliocytoma, also known as Lermit Douglas disease. It's a basically a amortomatous condition, most often associated with P10 mutation. And when it is associated with Cowden syndrome, then we call it as cold syndrome, Cowden associated Lermit Douglas disease. And it's a phacomatosis, basically. How do we identify? We, are, we should always see that it's a thickened, widened cerebellar folia with increased T2 signal, giving a striated appearance. They don't enhance, they don't show any blooming within them. And uh, hence, it is a no touch lesion. Generally, nobody operates on them. The close differential diagnosis one should consider are uh, cerebellitis. They will have a ca characteristic uh, history. Subacute cerebellar infarcts also can mimic this picture, but uh, subacute infarcts are, shows intense gyriform enhancement. Extensive nodular type of uh, medulloblastoma. Sometimes the uh, medulloblastoma, nodular medulloblastoma, which can come in the later age group, can also sometimes mimic, but they show restricted diffusion and variable enhancement. Next. So 40-year-old man uh, with a throbbing headache since four hours. On examination, found to have accelerated hypertension. So this patient was a young uh, man who presented to emergency with a headache. The MRI was done. He was, uh, probably was hypertensive, long-standing, unnoticed. He had a, this is a titivated axial images. You can see that bilateral symmetrical changes were noted in the corona radiata. You could see that uh, part of the thalamus, especially the putamen and the uh, clostrum area was showing a swollen appearance, hyper intense uh, and uh, almost symmetrical type of picture. It also showed a, a presence of signal changes in the brainstem as well. This is the upper part of the mid, uh, mid brain. And you could see this pons was also swollen appearance, somewhat striated in appearance. You can see through some transfer spontane fibers, median raphe on the titivated images involving the pons. And we thought, what is going on? Let's see the ADC pictures. ADC was showing T2 shine through. That It was not showing any dark signal. It was bright signal. Whenever we see bright signal, we are happy. It is not a dangerous sign. It is a vesogenic edema-like picture. You can see this. It was not restricted diffusion. It is not bad. Generally, whenever we see bright signal on ADC, we consider it as a good sign because they, most of the time they reverse. So this was a vesogenic edema here in the pons. And in the coronal t weighted images, you can appreciate the signal changes very well involving the basal ganglia, thalamus, and the brainstem. Some area of blooming was seen on the right putamen as well. Uh, largely, it was unremarkable. This is a flare changes. You can see this. So this is a classical case of atypical press involving brainstem. Sometimes this press is so atypical that in, uh, it sometimes only involves pons. So when it only involves pons, it is always uh, difficult to diagnose. People may consider it as uh, osmotic demyelination or glioma, something like that. We should always see a T2-weighted and uh, ADC pictures. ADC show vesogenic edema, do not enhance, no need to give contrast. And you can always characteristically see through the transverse spontane fibers and the median raphe because of vesogenic edema and T2 weighted and ADC pictures. And this is, you can, there are very good articles, the imaging of atypical and complicated press, hypertensive brainstem, encephalopathy. I will not go into this uh, details. This is another case. You can see the, this was a young female with the tingling numbness in the right upper limb, no deficits, MRI brain plane and contrast was done. And uh, this was a T2-weighted coronal, T2-weighted axial, diffusion-weighted images, and this is a gradient. All the other imaging sequences were absolutely normal, but only the gradient sequence was picking up some blooming, focal area of blooming. So this uh, resulted in contrast study, plain T1, very difficult to appreciate, subtle hypointensity in the upper part of the midbrain. But in the post contrast, there was subtle linear enhancement within that and uh, some vague enhancement around it. So some linear vascular type of central enhancement surrounded by linear uh, cloud like enhancement around it. And this was the picture on the axial and the coronal weighted images. Whenever we see this type of blooming, not seen in any other sequence, but if you give contrast, you will see this uh, linear vessel running and speculated enhancement around it. 
this is a characteristic uh, imaging picture uh, of a capillary telangiectasia if you see ct it will be normal no calcification no mineralization whenever we see this you should always uh, ignore this because this uh, this is no, uh, this is a class, classical uh, imaging picture of capillary telangiectasia mostly located in brain stem most common site is pons in our case it was in the mid brain often solitary but sometimes can be multiple and uh, characteristically the swi images are the clue most of the time it pick up uh, uh, subtle hypo intensity because of uh, slow flow and deox hemoglobin these are the uh, capillary malformation because of sluggish flow they are not bleeds uh, they have a, they are rich in deox hemoglobin that's why they show susceptibility because of uh, deox hemoglobin and if you do contrast especially the larger lesions show a speculated enhancement linear branching lesions uh, draining veins within that there are no touch lesions no need to do follow up also uh, because the imaging appearance are very very characteristic just reassurance is required so whenever you see remember this picture once you see this lesion you will never forget especially if the lesion is in the pons so young man with a history of testicular swelling this was an interesting case so i thought i should show this case young man with a history of testicular swelling in the since 6 months headache and generalized weakness since 1 month this was the lesion this was the only lesion which was present only in the pons and very very dramatic picture like it was a bilateral symmetrical t2 hypo intensity involving the pons with a perilesional edema when we gave contrast it was showing thick ring like enhancement around it whatever is bright around this hypo intensity was showing a ring like enhancement so it was reported as metastasis because the patient had a history of testicular mass then when we saw this uh, this was a t2 shortening surrounded by t2 uh, t2 hyper intensity around it and only this part was enhancing and there was no susceptibility there was no restricted diffusion and this was like a ghost appearance ghost face appearance and uh, this was actually a case of uh, tuberculoma and the testicular mass was uh, tubercular epididymo arcitis so whenever we see any mass we should not jump on to the car. especially in our country to a uh, primary lesion or a mass lesion we should always rule out tuberculomas this patient uh, this lesions were had all the imaging features which were suggestive of tuberculosis this patient then we proved that it was a tubercular epididymo arcitis and whatever was present in the brain was uh, uh, tuberculomas and this is another case uh, case number 18 35 year old lady presented with history uh, presented at the age of 8 years with a pedal edema uh, and distension of the abdomen on examination there was ascites and jaundice and this was the t1 weighted images the patient had a subtle changes uh, involving the brain stem and the deep gray matter you can see the thalamus putamen and the midbrain very difficult to pick up Uh, but on uh, t2 weighted images the imaging was very very classical you can see the thalamus bilateral symmetrical volume loss in the putamen some susceptibility or hypo intensity involving the globus pallidus region and involvement of the brain stem you can see here especially mid brain and the pons was also involved some patchy hyper intensity was additionally seen in the cerebellar white matter so same findings involvement of peduncles Uh, brain stem structures bright on t2 flare this is the susceptibility swi some blooming involving the deep gray matter so if you see this picture especially this picture uh, most of us who know who have seen such picture will never forget this is a typical case of uh, face of giant panda wilson's disease a prude case of wilson's disease showing a giant panda sign you can see that normal signal of the red uh, red nuclei here which are mimicking the eyes lateral aspect of the substantia nigra giving a picture of the ears of the panda eye signal on the tegmentin and the hypo intensity of the superior calculus ear can uh, mimic the face of the panda so if you see this similar signal changes in the pons we call it as miniature panda when the pons as well as the midbrain shows uh, two pandas there is a big and the small panda we call it as double panda sign so this has been uh, very well described and published from nimans lot of papers are there and you can see this typical uh, involvement of internal medullary velum in the thalamus giving a split thalamus or a coffee bean appearance uh, is also very very characteristic of uh, wilson's disease uh, so coming to next case uh, 58 year old female presented with sudden onset uh, left sided hemiplegia a day committing and altered sensorium known case of diabetic hypertension and hypothyroid 
we got a call uh, of acute stroke in window so we 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 do a mr based protocol patient was rushed to emergency within an hour so it was in window the patient was shifted to mri and these are the diffusion weighted images you can see that uh, diffusion weighted images and the adc images and uh, by the time we we were on the move this patient was uh, seen by our technician and uh, emergency doctors so they, they decided to give contrast because they did not expect uh, this picture uh, as per the clinically and uh, they saw that this heterogeneous signal uh, intensity lesion is present in the vessel ganglia on the right side both on t1 and t2 you can see this heterogeneity variable degree they thought it's a mass lesion and they thought we will give a contrast complete the study and give a call to neurosurgeon as well for, for the mass lesion so what do you think like this is a typical flare picture if you see carefully there is something in the ventricle as well and uh, this is a contrast which, uh, which was given there was a speck of contrast enhancement inside the center you can see something is going linear and there is a speck there hyper intensity on the tip of this vessel it was actually a a uh, large hematoma and this is a mr spot sign similar to a ct spot sign because mr sometimes can completely google uh, it, it 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 can completely hyperacute hematomas hyperacute uh, hypertensive bleeds can completely uh, confuse the uh, untrained eyes and it it can mimic a tumor and hence uh, uh, this was considered as tumor and the contrast was given this is a classical picture of mri spot sign uh, is analogous to ct spot sign and uh, generally we don't give contrast in acute emergency this was uh, by mistake it was given and it took up it pick up the mri spot sign which is a sign of impending hematoma expansion so we alert the surgeons because uh, they, they, they tend to expand uh, they, uh, very fast and this is one of the picture which i have taken from the social media just to show that how dramatic these uh, hypertensive bleeds are due to this uh, uh, charcot bouchard aneurysms from the lenticulostriate arteries this is a plain ct which was uh, unremarkable with the ct this is a multiphasic ct and in the first phase there was a speck of enhancement in the basal ganglia which grew and by the time the patient uh, ct ng was completed there was a massive hematoma with the interventricular rupture the patient went like this and came out like this so it was luckily captured all the picture of the same patient was captured from the ct scan from normal to abnormal and a, a very dangerous looking scan at the end so case number 20 35 year old man with a, he is a gym trainer in profession low back ache since 20 days no neurological deficits so he was advised mri of lumbar spine this is one of the common cases which we keep on getting uh, in our routine practice uh this signal changes in the adjoining end plates of l5 s1 you can see here in this the stir images this is the t2 weighted images these are the t1 weighted images you could see end plate signal changes also involving the discs and no much nothing in the paraspinal or the epidural space and uh, this was our t1 weighted images we generally when we see this we also do a diffusion weighted images of this corresponding area and this corresponding diffusion was showing something linear hyper intensity like this and this is a stir just i have zoomed it to show what it is and whenever we see this we are very happy this is known as a diffusion weighted class sign this was published in uh, ajnr you can see this original paper later on and this is a very very characteristic of uh, type 1 modic end plate change that is a uh, edema not a infection this basically represents uh, this uh, band and this is uh, this is called as mr diffusion class sign you can see this claw like hyper intensity and this claw sign uh, is a basically a granulation tissue and the edema and this is the normal barrow the upper margin of the granulation tissue and edema uh, always show some restricted diffusion whenever this is absent uh, we generally give contrast and complete the study probably we are dealing with the spondylodiscitis when they when we don't see a claw sign when there is a claw sign uh, we generally reassure probably it is a modic end plate change most of the time we have a history of a sudden weight lift or a jerk which was there in this patient and we generally do a close follow up and uh, uh, see that it's uh, not missed spondylodiscitis is not missed and uh, just wanted to show uh, the importance of diff uh, diffusion weighted uh, classing another case 48 year old man presented with a progressive left sided foot drop no case of diabetes hypertension mri brain and spine contrast was done uh, elsewhere spine was unremarkable brain showed few lesions for which biopsy was recommended 
and uh, this was some vip patient who came to us uh, with this type of picture it was done outside there was uh, this was a titivated axial and coronal images what i could see was a very intense bright uh, t2 hyperintense hi lesion surrounded by hypotensive rim and uh, edema very minimal edema around it there were lesions in the white matter some other lesions also i could find uh, in the juxtacortical and periventricular region uh, since the he was in a middle age uh, there was a report saying that probably these are mets primary so many differential diagnosis was there so whether to do a biopsy or what to do what is the next thing was uh, was the question when i saw these corpus callosal lesions and uh, when the flare images was seen like this i could see something going in the center of this lesion this dot like hyperintensity in the flare you can see in the sag flare linear hyperintensity in the axial there it was a dot and the spectroscopy was done which was not very much useful and i did not give me anything i thought let us do a contrast as well and complete the study then give a final diagnosis i could see this uh, linear uh, structure within the lesion was a vessel traversing through and through and this lesion was showing a broken type of ring enhancement it was not a complete ring it was a broken ring like enhancement uh, this was how it was appearing the center was not at all showing restricted diffusion it was not an abscess or a, it is not, in abscess generally we get a, a central core of restricted diffusion if it is a lymphoma or any other we get entire lesion being showing restricted diffusion so it was a this was a typical appearance by looking at this vessel and the broken ring i told it's a case of uh, demyelination we will wait and watch rather than doing biopsy so i, I was i am trying to show a zoomed picture of this uh, linear hyperintensity which helped me to, which gave me actually confidence uh, uh, of saying that it's not a tumor lesion it's a demyelinating lesion and if you see the pathophysiology if you see perivascular inflammation the, along the venule this is how this lesion because it in most of the histopathology up to 91% of the lesions show this perivenous origin of this demyelination what i did was i did a close follow up of this patient after a course of steroid therapy you can see that a significant reduction in the size of the lesion and and uh, it almost disappeared in a follow up uh, flare images so another uh, condition where the vessel travels through and through the center of the lesion this is a case of oligodendroglioma but uh, there was a cystic lesion in the other side adjacent to the anterior commissure vessel ganglia region and uh, there was a vessel through and through that so whenever i see a vessel through and through a such a cystic lesion without any enhancement absolutely benign looking lesion then it is generally a perivascular space this is the same case you can see that uh, is a work work or abin spaces so these are the two conditions i thought we should uh, how the vessel traveling through the center of the lesion will help us to make a diagnosis this is another incidentally detected lesion in a 48 year old female patient the patient came with a vague history of uh, neck pain uh, then uh, when we did an mri we could see there was a large soft tissue surrounding this uh, vertebral body and uh, we also did a ct scan uh, so what was surprising was uh, the adjacent disc was completely spared the anatomy of the vertebral bodies are very well preserved it was neither collapsed nor destroyed there was no end plate sclerosis destruction disc was not involved there was no collection what on contrast everything was enhancing including the vertebral body and a disproportionately large soft tissue so there was some amount of sclerosis like picture uh, you can see this vertebral body showing sclerosis even the posterior element was showing edema on the t2 so this appearance uh, whenever we see that relative preservation of the anatomical boundaries no destruction no erosion no collection and intense homogeneous enhancement the our first differential diagnosis is most likely a primary paravertebral lymphoma this is a vertebral body lymphomas and in another companion case you can see here anatomy is well preserved except marrow changes it is not destroyed but there is a large soft tissue going into the epidural space here encasing it and if you do diffusion as well if you see these are the signal changes if you do, this is in the involving the sacrum you can see the sacral foramen the uh, encasing the nerve root had a severe pain on the right side and if you do a diffusion uh, in this such cases you can get a restricted diffusion as well homogeneously enhancing restricted diffusion no destruction or reduction in the height of the vertebral body uh, very very characteristic of uh, spinal lymphomas we did a biopsy in this case 
and it, it is again confirmed as a lymphoma. So whenever, uh, so that these are the important clues, relative sparing of the disc spaces and no destruction of the vertebral body, no collection, only soft tissue, homogeneously enhancing may show restricted diffusion. Similarly, young boy who after playing a sports uh, came with a, a sudden onset severe backache followed by paraplegia. So this was a, a case we, uh, we thought uh, with the history, we thought we are dealing with the spinal cord infarct, interspinal artery infarct. But when we saw the imaging, there was a heterogeneous lesion within the uh, spinal cord, intramedullary lesion. And there was a lot of hyperintensity on either side of this lesion, expansive lesion. You can see that that uh, hyperintensity was also present on T1. It was bright on T1 as well on either side of this lesion. You can see this, this is a T2 weighted images. This is a plain T1. You can see here, plain T1 showing some bright signal intensity on either side of the lesion. And when we gave contrast, there was no difference. Already it was bright. So this was also bright on post contrast, no enhancement, neither, neither the lesion or the hyperintensity around it uh, uh, was enhancing. So whenever we see such picture, this heterogeneous type of picture on T2 within the card with the bright signal intensity on either side, is a very, very classical picture. And you can see that uh, hyperintensity is going up to the lower cervical cord. It's a classical picture of uh, cavernoma rupturing, causing hematomyelia. This is the blood product. So this is a T1 hyperintense blood. Uh, the, uh, the cavernomas do not enhance on contrast. So intramedullary uh, cavernomas, when they present with hematomyelia, they can present with abrupt onset of uh, symptoms as in this case. And if you do... Uh, in few cases, in few patients, if you do the brain also, if you want to confirm the diagnosis, you may get cavernomas like this elsewhere. This is a typical uh, appearance of cavernoma blooming on the gradient images. Typical uh, appearance known as popcorn appearance uh, because they are bright and dark, both on T1 and T2. They have heterogeneous signal and sometimes there will be hemocytrin uh, staining around it because of rec recurrent low-grade bleed. So that is a case. Another case, middle-aged man with ataxia reduced hearing and headaches in six months. I just wanted to show a spectrum of hemocytrine and the blooming in the brain. This is a typical appearance. This is the gradient images because all other sequences were normal. When we saw the gradient images, there were cerebellar foliar hypointensity uh, along the foliar spaces and also along the sulcal spaces as you go higher. And other sequences were completely unremarkable. Whenever we see such things, we can consider it as a superficial residrosis. We, the most common condition to cause superficial sidrosis is a, a cavernoma, which ruptures and low-grade repeated bleeds. And when we don't see anything in the brain, we generally also rule out dural AV fistulas and any other vascular malformations. But most importantly, don't forget to screen their spine. Whenever we see un, uh, uh, unknown cause of uh, superficial sidrosis, some superficial sidrosis are also associated with uh, spinal CSF leaks as well. In this case, we could see a lesion in the spine, in the conus, um, uh, conus cauda region. This is a lesion. This was intradural extramedullary, uh, abutting the tip of the conus. And there was some serpiginous vascular channels, which is around this lesion. And uh, if you see here carefully, there was a fluid level, blood fluid level here in the dependent portion of the tecal sac. And uh, uh, all, we did a gradient image for the spine as well. We could see a hemocytin standing all around it. This is a typical case of, uh, this is a homogeneously enhancing lesion again. This is a typical case of paraganglioma. This paraganglioma, especially in the conus medullaris, this is one of the commonest site for spinal paragangliomas. Whenever these are present, they cause recurrent low-grade bleeds and they can present with superficial sidrosis. So there are several case reports uh, of paragangliomas causing superficial sidrosis. So remember to screen spine when you don't get anything in the brain in cases of superficial sidrosis. Another case, 50-year-old man, non-specific index in six months, not associated with nausea, vomiting, blurring, or blurring of vision, referred to our hospital with CT diagnosis of metastasis to occipital bone. So this was the finding. What uh, this is actually a very, very characteristic appearance. If you keep on seeing a lot of MRIs, you will uh, dismiss these findings. If you see these uh, posterior fossa, especially the occipital bone, you could see that on T2-weighted images, there are a lot of T2 hyperintense uh, cystic areas, which was burrowing into the inner table of the uh, occipital bone on either side, basically. Uh, and uh, you can see the same in different imaging sequences. When CT is done, 
the inner table is usually eroded or cystic but outer table is always almost always it is intact you can see here so whenever we see this we generally reassure both the referring doctor as well as the patients that it is a it is known as kedo kedo stands for cluster of arachnoid diverticular in the occipital bone it is a arachnoid granulation basically often misdiagnosed as infective or neoplastic process patient will be unnecessarily subjected to investigation and sometimes surgical intervention like biopsies so all radiologists should uh, identify this benign entity and avoid unnecessary intervention there are uh, some guidelines saying that how to identify a kedo uh, if you have a elderly patient coming with the involvement of the occipital bone midline and multiple intact outer table non sclerotic margins these are all very very characteristic findings and uh, whenever you see that we need just we have to label them as arach benign arachnoid granulation reassure them no need to subject the patient for further interventions is a 20 sir. year old uh, female sir, sir? Uh, yes sir we want to we want to cover the remaining ones in uh, another session Or, yes uh, sir uh, so i will shall i complete this uh, case yes yes after that we will stop this okay yeah please go ahead 20 year old uh, female with difficulty in walking since birth on examination there was a spasticity of both lower limbs and uh, this was a uh, imaging findings this is a flare axial images t2 coronal images and um, basically there was a subtle imaging findings you can see that there was a subtle periventricular hyperintensity uh, and uh, especially along the tip of the frontal horns here and if you see that in the coronal images you could hardly see the corpus callosum the corpus callosum was markedly thinned out and this was a typical imaging appearance uh, of the uh, frontal caps this is known as uh, year of uh, link sign which is said to be very very specific to uh, hereditary spastic paraplegia uh, uh, spg 11 and 15 whenever you find this type of hyper intensity associated with thinning of corpus callosum always raise the possibility in appropriate clinical setting and this patient had a thin corpus callosum you can see here associated with dorsal cord atrophy which is also a very common finding if you see carefully giving this uh, racing car appearance sometimes the callosum so this is a case of hsp and uh, uh, it uh, the, you should remember the periventricular signal changes especially around the frontal horns and the uh, thin corpus callosum with or without thin corpus callosum and uh, variable involvement of the dorsal cord so i think sir uh, we will stop at this level uh, yes. we can show next 25 cases in next sitting thank you very much it was a wonderful presentation and uh, i know you work for almost two months to collect all the cases i see you working on <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> just to archive these cases very nice uh, so i'm sure should we us, take the questions yeah. or how do we progress let us see i think there is one question just now asking you to explain yes, the dural av fistula spinal av fistula somebody want to shall i go to the uh, imaging case sir uh, yeah. Yeah, Should I, I go to that imaging and then explain? Yes, yes, please go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. So spinal dural AV fistula is very very easy to diagnose once you see a typical case. Uh, there is no confusion. Basically, uh, the early cases, especially uh, when the appropriate imaging sequences are not done. Generally, how do we see is. Uh, whenever the you get a case of letms like a present, a imaging picture you get a long segment uh, myelitis like picture with a relative sparing of the periphery like this and uh, on t2 weighted images because you may miss everything in other sequences uh, the gradient sequence t1 weighted sequence uh, when uh, you should always see the t2 sagittal images what we do is generally uh, we have to educate the technicians when they do whole spine screening they should not cover entire length of the spine in one picture we always ask them to do in three different stations cervical dorsal and lumbar because if they keep a large field of view uh, the image goes dezoomed and uh, the subtle findings in around the card always will be missed so whenever we see this subtle hyper intensity uh, generally we ask them to do a cis uh, 3d sequence that is evolute t2 weighted images and uh, we always uh, when we do such sequences we get serpiginous channels sometimes these vascular flow voids can be 
can be confused with the CSF flavoids. CSF flavoids in dorsal cord, especially the growing children, young children and the teenagers is very common because the dorsal cord is very anterior, if you see normally, and the posterior uh, CSF space, the posterior to the cord will be very prominent. That results in CSF turbulence, which we can mimic flavoid. But if you uh, ask the technician to do a flow, uh, flow suppress sequences, they have a technical things which they can suppress the uh, flow voids and uh, CSF flow voids, but which do not get suppressed. Uh, CSF dura levi fistulas flow voids do not get suppressed. But it's not, never confusing because these serpiginous venous channels are, uh, you can track them, you can trace these venous channels, unlike blotchy T2 large high, 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 high point intensities of CSF flow void, which I should have put here, I have not put. But uh, when associated with uh, card abnormality, elderly male presenting with a typical history and uh, complete this with a CIS3D or with a contrast, you will never miss a abnormal flow voids. Uh, anything else, sir? Any other questions? No other questions so far. I think those of us who work with you or associated with you are able to diagnose most of these spotters. I can see the messages coming up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> And uh, those who have not worked with neuroradiologists like you, this uh, acts as a very good stimulus to learn more. And, uh, True, sir. I'm sure they're all very excited to listen to you. And uh, hope to see you in the next session with more cases. Yes, sir. And I thank yes, Sun yes, Pharma. They have provided the excellent technical support to the meeting mentor. Yes, sir. We should. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is thank one you. question. If you are still there, one question is there. How to differentiate yes. ependymitis granularis yeah. from ear of links? Yeah, yeah, yeah. ependymitis granularis are another uh, important uh, anatomical uh, finding, which is a normal physiological finding, which is known as frontal caps. These frontal caps uh, are nothing but uh, C uh, CSF uh, ooze along the periventricular region, where the blood uh, ependymal lining is uh, not so well formed. And uh, these uh, are usually globular in appearance, rounded. But these uh, ear of links, usually they are linear. They are like uh, linear strands. If you see coronal images, uh, uh, the, these appear like a ear of links. And uh, whenever we see this uh, in isolation, we may definitely get confused with the ependymitis granularis of the frontal horns, are also known as frontal caps. We always, uh, whenever we see this, we always see the corpus callosum. Look at the history. If the spine is done, then I also look at the spine. If the patient have any walking difficulty or a paraparesis, spasticity, then only we, uh, we raise the possibility of this. Isolated ependymitis granularis is always like T2 hyperintense. They may be variably suppressed on flare, but uh, uh, ear of links will never get suppressed on flare. They will be linear and uh, uh, more elongated as compared to ependymitis granularis. There is another question from uh, Dr. Bindu. Uh, how to yes, differentiate sir. traversing vessel sign? Can you tell how to differentiate? She is not mentioned from what. Dr. Bindu, can you unmute and ask the question? Dr. Bindu? She is not there, I think. Uh, this, uh, I think uh, that was a case of oligodendroglioma adjacent to that I had a lesion. So, I, uh, probably this oligodendroglioma created the confusion, I think, that tumor. So, ma'am has written here oligodendroglioma on seeing traversing vessel sign. Now, it is nothing to do with the tumor. That was uh, just a case representation to show that uh, whenever you see a cystic lesion and a vessel traveling through the center of that cystic lesion, uh, a solitary enlarged VR space is a differential diagnosis. is nothing to do with the tumor or uh, related to tumor diagnosis. It's an isolated finding. Since I was discussing with a, a traversing vessel sign of a demyelination, I thought another condition which shows similar picture is a VR space, but the only difference is they are pure cystic suppressed on the flare, do not enhance and no perilegional edema. So that uh, that was the basic uh, reason why I showed it. Yes, I think you have clarified that part. Okay, another five minutes, we'll wait. If any questions are there, we'll take up. Yes, sir. I thought I can finish, but I, th I think I was going very slow, so I could only finish 25 cases. No, I, I didn't want you to rush through this. 
Okay. <laughs> because you have to give all the points, differentiation. That is the way to learn. So we can cover in next yes, class. Whenever you are free, we will take it up. Okay. And, uh, sure, sir. All sure, the presentations sir. are available on YouTube, so there is no problem. Another question. Okay. When can we see earliest changes of cord in fat in MRI and how sensitive is diffusion weighted image of the cord for a diagnosis of infarction? Yes, sir. Unlike uh, unlike uh, supratentorial uh, ischemic infarcts, which can pick up the lesions in 15 to 30 minutes, usually the post of fossa, that especially the brainstem and the spinal cord, uh, do not show the signal changes as early as 30 minutes. Usually they they are in, they are very much delayed. Pro nobody knows like how how many hours exactly it shows, but they say that. Uh, uh, around uh, 30 to 40 percent of the uh, acute ischemic infarcts uh, are seen in the first six hours. Uh, the rest of them are generally picked up uh, after 24 hours. Not more than 50 percent uh, shows characteristic uh, diffusion changes in the central gray matter. But uh, nowadays, because of availability of three Tesla MRI and better uh, 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 gradient uh, gradient strength in the MR magnetic field uh, with high B values. These lesions, can, the percentage of pick, uh, picking up the acute lesions in the spinal cord are going up. We, nobody knows the exact fi figures, but uh, nearly 30 uh, with three Tesla or higher Tesla MRI, 30 to 40 percent can be completely missed, but up to 60 percent they can pick up these acute lesions in the brainstem and the spinal cord. The classical history is very, very important. And uh, if you see that subtle changes at higher B values uh, with the uh, zoomed uh, DWI, uh, then probably your uh, diagnosis will be very, very uh, characteristic. I think they are asking like uh, NCC, TB, because this uh, I didn't intentionally didn't include NCC and TB or other uh, infective process because it itself is a diff uh, different talk. In imaging in neuroinfection, we can consider it uh, in a different talk because it should include all those things. Sure. We may have to take a separate talk for that. Yeah, sure. The TB in the pons was not confirmed. The tibidedema architis uh, was proved to be TB, and the, uh, that's how we uh, diagnosed it as a content TB. Because it had all the features suggestive of TB and imaging of brain. Okay, I think if there are no more questions. Thank you once again very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Wonderful talk, very informative. I'm sure everybody benefited from your presentation. Sure. Thank, thank, you, you, sir. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, I request Mr. Dinesh. Sir, let me uh, From some form. Say a few words and then we'll close. Sailendra, want to close the session? Okay. Nobody is there. We'll uh, close the session. Thank you again, Dr. Sharath. And thank all you, the participants. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.